Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Nicomachean Ethics, Book 9, Aristotle approaches something that he started discussing in Nicomachean Ethics, Book 8, in terms of friendship. Namely, um, should the friendship continue when the friends change? And we don't mean changing just a little bit, but changing in ways that are significant, that, that put a strain on the friendship, that perhaps uh, introduce tensions or conflicts into the friendship. And for Aristotle, he doesn't seem to consider cases where, you know, it's a familial relationship. You're kind of stuck with, with family, and they, they will change over time. Uh, and that's not something he, he worries particularly about. He does say it's possible for a son, a son to be disowned by his father, but not uh, vice versa. But he doesn't follow that up. What we're more interested in are cases in terms of these three fundamental goods that Aristotle has, has used to distinguish types of friendship. And he says, um, this actually happens quite often in terms of uh, certain kinds of friendships, you know, the basis for the relationship changes, uh, particularly when it's a matter of usefulness, tosum feron or to chrysimon, or pleasure, uh, hedone, uh, to, to hedus. Um, those sorts of things, are by their nature rather shifting. Um, you know, he gives the example of, of younger people, this is coming up in book eight, where he says that they're, they're really driven primarily by pleasure, so they have a lot of friendships based on pleasure. You know, you see kids on the playground playing with each other and saying, hey, meet my new friend, right? And they're, they're friends because they enjoy that activity together. Um, but they, they can quickly break up as well and, and cease being friends because the, the, the pleasures not only are fairly fleeting, but as children grow, they, they begin to appreciate different pleasures and to leave, you know, more childish pleasures behind. You know, my, uh, I'll just give you an example from my own children. A frequent comment when it came to certain television shows that we used to watch together, uh, I as the adult having to watch the show but getting something out of it and then the kid you know being very very happy with the show uh, you know later on I'd say hey do you want to watch this you want to watch that and and both of my kids would say that's for babies I don't watch that sort of thing anymore you know I hate Elmo I used to love Elmo but now I hate Elmo or, you know pick whatever you want um, that's pretty common and, and as people age their, their pleasures change, and so you know Aristotle thinks that it's, it's perfectly reasonable if you're in a relationship that is fundamentally based on sharing pleasures together, if you no longer get that pleasure out of it, why should you continue the relationship? Aristotle doesn't see there being sort of a sense of duty to just you know maintain contact, stay in touch, you know, uh, see the person uh, socially so that you can remember the friendship that you had. He doesn't say that you couldn't do that, but he thinks that it's quite reasonable for us to, to break up relationships that no longer serve us in that way. We weren't, we weren't friends with the person on the basis of who they are at their core identity. We're friends with them on, on the basis of the pleasure that they provide and them with us. Uh, same thing with, with usefulness. So, um, that, he says, makes perfect sense. There is a problem that he talks about, and this is really worth thinking about. Like I put here, this is a frequent issue. Um, this is a frequent sub-issue, he says. Um, here we go. A man may well complain if, though we really liked him for the profit or pleasure he afforded, we had pretended to love him for his character. This happens a lot. 
um, people tell each other that they are, are friends with each other on the basis of their character, who they are, that they're going to be friends forever, friends no matter what happens. And really what they're doing is they're, they're just trying to get something out of it. Um, I'll give you a sort of common example that I saw when I was in college, something that I, I found uh, quite painful to watch year after year after year. There were these you know, older guys, generally juniors and seniors, uh, quite often within you know, some sort of club or fraternity, and uh, they were just waiting for the new crop of freshman students to come in, fresh out of high school, um, you know, fairly naive, uh, lots of, of, of young girls who then these guys would immediately connect up with and start sweet talking and tell them how interested they were in them and, and how they found them so beautiful, so fascinating, you know, all these sort of characteristics, right? And you say, well, that, that's primarily a matter of pleasure and they're going to be exchanging pleasure once they, you know, once they're involved romantically. Um, but really what was going on is, is these guys were telling these girls how, how great they were as persons. And these girls uh, were, you know, quite happy to hear that, uh, you know, coming in as, as freshmen. Suddenly there's somebody and, you know, somebody who's, who matters on campus is, is paying attention to them. And you could tell that, you know, I mean, the way that these guys talk, they had no regard for these girls at all. And shortly after sleeping with them, they would give them the cold shoulder, and uh, that would be the end of it. And it led to a lot of recriminations. Um, some of the guys had contests about this sort of thing with each other. I always found that, that sort of thing disgusting and tried to warn some of the girls about that, uh, but quickly gave, gave up because uh, it was just a dynamic that would keep on happening. Um, well, that's an example of somebody deliberately misleading another person about the basis for the friendship and then breaking off the, the friendship. Aristotle says that it's possible for us to be misled. It's also possible for us to mistake things, to mislead ourselves. So he says, um, here we go. And as was said at the outset, differences between friends most frequently arrive when the nature of their friendship is not what they think it is. When a man has made a mistake and has fancied that he was loved for his character, without there having been anything in the friend's behavior to warrant that assumption, he has only himself to blame. So if, it, if the, the person didn't lead us on, if they didn't uh, you know, tell us things that really were stretching the truth or just weren't true at all, then it's our fault if we get that wrong. And we shouldn't be so naive as to think that people who are just business contacts really love us for who we are. I mean, they may use that vocabulary in the business context, you know, in sales or in networking events, but we should know better. We should be smarter than that, Aristotle thinks. We shouldn't be naive. Um, similarly with romantic relationships. It's, it's tough, especially when we're young, but we should probably be a little bit more guarded and not give, give, you know, give in to our hormones and hopes, right? Um, so if we're misled by it, or if we're mi mistaken, that's our own fault. What if somebody else misleads us? Aristotle says this is a, a very bad thing. He says, um, when he's been deceived by his friend's pretense, there is ground for complaint against the deceiver. Okay, that's fairly neutral. Um, in fact, this person is a worse wrongdoer than those who counterfeit the coinage. That was a bad thing in ancient times. That would get you killed, right? Counterfeiting coinage. Insofar as his offense touches something much more precious than money. So if counterfeiting uh, the coinage is bad, or, or for example, in academic context, if plagiarism is a despicable action that, um, you know, in, in essence, passes off somebody else's work as one's own, it's in effect theft, right? Um, deceiving somebody about the basis for their friendship is even more despicable. It's, it's you know, deliberately counterfeiting the coinage of friendship or, or love. And so Aristotle thinks that, you know, we should, we should be uh, quite condemning of, of, of that sort of behavior. Now, another topic that he talks about in this uh, issue is, well, what should we do about the good person who becomes bad? How should we treat a person who we are connected with and are friends with because they are, in fact, a genuinely good person? 
what happens when they slide down the you know the the slippery slope or you know maybe a very bumpy slope you know lots and lots of uh, points along the way uh, and become a, pa a bad person Aristotle says well this is tricky there's two ways we could look at this one is that it would be reasonable to cut them loose and say I can't be friends with you anymore because um, we don't really have anything in common we're no longer on the same page, morally speaking. And as a matter of fact, because you're a bad person, I shouldn't be friends with you. I should not be loving what is bad. This is an Aristotelian take on things. Um, so it would be reasonable to break off the, the friendship in that case. He does also suggest another possibility, though. And this is quite interesting. He says, maybe we actually have a duty to try to help that friend. He says, um, perhaps we should not break it off in every case, but only when our friends have become incurably bad. So long as there's some possibility of our friend making their way back to goodness, perhaps with us as, as some sort of contributory cause or a support system or providing resources, something like that, we should, in fact, help them. And he makes a really great argument here. He says, um, so long as they're capable of reform, we're even more bound to help them morally than we would be to assist them financially. Why? Because character is a more valuable thing than wealth and has more to do with friendship. So if, if we really value that person for who they are and now they start to become a bad person, but they could be steered back towards goodness, Aristotle says, look, you'd help out a friend in, in bad financial circumstances, and that's extrinsic goods. You're talking now about who that person is in themselves. So you think about, for example, friends who are going through difficult times, the things that often take a toll upon us, like um, you know, divorces, for example, or, or deaths, or losses of, of position and, and jobs. These are things that, for people who are not completely virtuous, and that includes myself, by the way, speaking from experience here, those can really throw a person for a loop. A person might say, well, screw it, being a good person doesn't help me at all. It's a kind of common reaction. And, um, you know, what do we do with a friend like that? So long as we think that they have some possibility, some real possibility, not, not just some abstract, imaginary possibility, of, of coming back into the fold, we should try to, to extend a hand to them and, and help them out because character is more valuable than money. The last thing that Aristotle talks about, this last discussion, has to do with, well, what about when we have the opposite happen? The friend doesn't go from being good to being bad, but the friend goes from being maybe, you know, sort of good to being superlatively good. Or um, the friend goes from just being a you know, run-of-the-mill kind of person to being somebody who's a major player. There's some sort of drastic change in superiority. He says, are we then to behave towards a former friend? Or, uh, he says, suppose one friend to have remained the same while the other has improved and become greatly the superior in virtue. Should, should the latter keep up the friendship? And Aristotle says, it, it's, it's tough to say. The wider the gap, the less there is a basis for friendship there, or the friendship of the original sort. So um, he says that uh, this is really clear, like when two people who were friends in, in childhood, one may have remained a boy in mind, while the other is a man of the highest ability. How can they be friends when they have different tastes and different likes and dislikes? They will no longer even enjoy each other's society. But without this, we can't really have a friendship. So, you know, you start out, um, you know, in your small town and you've got your circle of friends that you, you know, do these fun activities with uh, after, after school, during high school, and now you go off to college and they stay behind and some, you know, some of them actually engage in intellectual life on their own, say through YouTube, right? Um, and the others just, you know, hang around and drink and um, watch TV, right? After a while, you come back and you're like, yeah, I don't really have that much in common with these people anymore. I really liked them, but now, you know, it's kind of awkward when we get together at the bar, you know, over Thanksgiving, right? 
um, you, you've lost that basis for the friendship. And the same thing can happen to us as well if we just sit still and other people develop. So he says, um, are, are, how should we behave then towards these people? He says, are we to behave towards a former friend in exactly the same way as if he'd never been our friend? Perhaps we ought to remember our past intimacy, and just as we think it right to show more kindness to friends than to strangers, maybe we should pay some attention to the person, but they're, they're no longer friends in that case. And so there's a lot of uh, times when a change in the persons, change in the kind of persons that we're talking about, can actually produce uh, a breakdown or uh, you know, an irrevocable break to the friendship. 